Hey, good morning. Let's read the stable LFS book, version 11.1, published March 1st, 2022. Let's read it for about 30, 30 minutes. <coughs> All right, so the foreword. My journey to learn and better understand Linux began in 1998. I had just installed my first Linux distribution and had quickly become intrigued with the whole concept and philosophy behind Linux. There are always many ways to accomplish a single task. The same can be said about Linux distributions. A great many have existed over the years. Some still exist. Some have morphed into something else. Yet others have been relegated to our memories. They all do things differently to suit the needs of their target audience. Because so many different ways to accomplish the same end goal exist. I began to realize I no longer had to be limited by any one implementation. Prior to discovering Linux, we simply put up with issues in other operating systems as you had no choice. It was what it was, whether you liked it or not. With Linux, the concept of choice began to emerge. If you didn't like something, you were free, even encouraged, to change it. I tried a number of distributions and could not decide on any one. They were great systems in their own right. It wasn't a matter of right and wrong anymore. It had become a matter of personal taste. With all that choice available, it became apparent that there would not be a single system that would be perfect for me. So I set out to create my own Linux system that would fully conform to my personal preferences. To truly make it my own system, I resolved to compile everything from source code, code instead of using pre-compiled binary packages. This perfect Linux system would have the strengths of various systems without their perceived weaknesses. At first, the idea was rather daunting. I remain committed to the idea that such a system could be built. After sorting through issues such as circular dependencies and compile time errors, I finally built a custom-built Linux system. It was fully operational and perfectly usable like any of, of the other Linux systems out there at the time. But it was my own creation. It was very satisfying to have put together such a system myself. The only thing better would have been to create each piece of software myself. This was the next best thing. As I shared my goals and experiences with other members of the Linux community, it became apparent that there was a sustained interest in these ideas. It quickly became plain that such custom-built Linux systems serve not only to meet user-specific requirements, but also serve as an ideal learning opportunity for programmers and system administrators to enhance their existing Linux skills. Out of this broadened interest, the Linux from Scratch project was born. This Linux from Scratch book is the central core around that project. It provides the background and instructions necessary for you to design and build your own system. While this book provides a template that will result in a correct working system, you are free to alter the instructions to suit yourself, which is, in part, an important part of this project. You remain in control. We just lend a helping hand to get you started on your own journey. 
I sincerely hope you will have a great time working on your own Linux from scratch system and enjoy the numerous benefits of having a system that is truly your own. Next. Audience. There are many reasons why you, should, uh, you would want to read this book. One of the questions many people raise is, why go through all the hassle of manually building a Linux system from scratch when you can just download and install an existing one? One important reason for the, this project's existence is to help you learn how a Linux system works from the inside out. Building a Linux, Linux from scratch system helps demonstrate what makes Linux tick and how things work together and depend on each other. One of the best things that this learning experience can provide is the ability to customize a Linux system to suit your own unique needs. Another key benefit of LFS is that it allows you to have more control over the system without relying on someone else's Linux implementation. With LFS, you are in the driver's seat and dictate every aspect of the system. LFS allows you to create very compact Linux systems. When installing regular distributions, you are often forced to install a great many programs, which are probably never used or understood. Uh, something like this. <laughs> oh, you know, I don't understand a lot of these. Um, never used or understood. These programs waste resources. You may argue that with today's hard drive and CPUs, such resources are no longer a consideration. Sometimes, however, you are still constrained by size considerations, if nothing else. Think about bootable CDs, USB sticks, and embedded systems. Those are areas where LFS can be beneficial. Another advantage of a custom-built Linux system is security. By compiling the entire system from source code, you are empowered to audit everything and apply all the security patches desired. It is no longer necessary to wait for somebody else to compile binary packages that fix a security hole. What is that? It's no longer for somebody else. Uh, unless you examine the patch and implement it yourself, you have no guarantee that the new binary package was built correctly and adequately fixes the problem. Uh, that's kind of a cool thought. The goal of Linux from scratch is to build a complete and usable foundation level system. If you do not wish to build your own Linux system from scratch, you may nevertheless benefit from the information in this book. There are too many other good reasons to build your own LFS system to list them all here. In the end, education is by far the most powerful of reasons. As you continue in your LFS experience, you will discover the power that information and knowledge truly bring. Next. <coughs> Pardon me. LFS target architectures. The primary target, let me see if I can make this bigger. Okay, it's a little better. The primary target architectures of LFS are the AMD Intel x86 32-bit and x86 64 or 64-bit CPUs. On the other hand, the instructions in this book are also known to work with some modifications with the PowerPC and ARM CPUs. To build a system that utilizes one of these CPUs, the main prerequisite, in addition to those on the next page, is an existing Linux system, such as an earlier LFS installation. 
Ubuntu, Red Hat Fedora, SUSE, or other distribution that targets the architecture that you have. Also note that a 32-bit distribution can be installed and used as a host system on a 64-bit AMD Intel computer. Okay, so we're using Ubuntu for this. For building LFS, the gain of building on a 64-bit system compared to a 32-bit system is minimal. For example, in a test build of LFS 9.1 on a Core i7-4790 CPU-based system using four cores, the following statistics were measured. The architecture between 32 and 64, the build time, and the build size. Uh, in the 64-bit, the time was lower with a larger build size. As you can see on the same hardware, the 64-bit build is only 3% faster and is 22% larger than the 32-bit build. If you plan to use LFS as a LAMP server or a firewall, a 32-bit CPU may be largely sufficient. On the other hand, several packages in BLFS now need more than 4 gigabytes of RAM to be built and or to run, so that if you plan to use LFS as a desktop, the LFS authors recommend building on a 64-bit system. The default 64-bit build that results from LFS is considered a pure 64-bit system. That is, it supports 64-bit executables only. Building a multi-lib system requires compiling many applications twice, once for a 32-bit system and once for a 64-bit system. This is not directly supported in LFS because it would interfere with the educational objective of providing the instructions needed for a straightforward base Linux system. Some LFS, BLFS editors maintain a fork of LFS for multi-lib, which is accessible at, uh, let's see, Lennox from scratch, Tilda Thomas, multi-lib index. Um, so this is multi-library. I'm not doing that. But this is an advanced topic. Next, prerequisites. Building an LFS system is not a simple task. It requires a certain level of existing knowledge of Unix system administration in order to resolve problems and correctly execute the commands listed. In particular, as an absolute minimum, you should already have the ability to use the command line, shell, to copy or move files and directories, list directory and file contents, and change the current directory. Well, let's see, to copy or move files, I pretty much know how to do that. Um, list directory and file contents. Okay, know how to do that. And change the current directory. Sure. It is also expected that you have a reasonable knowledge of using and installing Linux software. Um, well, I know how to use a search engine <laughs> and package managers and copy and paste. Because the LFS book assumes at least this basic level of skill, the various LFS support forums are unlikely to be able to provide you with much assistance in these areas. You will find that um, your questions regarding such basic knowledge will likely go unanswered or you will simply be referred to the LFS essential pre-reading list. Before building an LFS system, we recommend reading the following. So let's do this. Let's make a folder on Vivaldi here. 
Um, and let's call it LFS. And um, now let's make a recommended reading folder. Um, let's use, what is it called, camel case. This should be in there. And let's move this over here. All right, let's see what their recommended reading is. Building and installing software packages for Linux. Hey, July 1999, only 20 years old. All right, let's bookmark that in recommended reading. This is a comprehensive guide to building and installing generic Unix software packages under Linux. Although it was written some time ago, it still provides a good summary of the basic techniques needed to build and install software. The next reference is Beginner's Guide to Installing from Source. It is published in 2015. So that is, this is 2022, so that's only, what, seven years old now? Um, let's add that to recommended reading. Okay. This guide provides a good summary of basic skills and techniques needed to build software from source code. Next. LFS and, uh, the, the and standards. The structure of LFS follows Linux standards as closely as possible. The primary standards are POSIX.1-2008. Oh, so let's add to this LFS um, a standards folder. Why is it not putting it in there? Okay, so POSIX file system hierarchy standard FHS version 3.0 and Linux standard base LSB version 5.0, 2015. Okay, so uh, let's bookmark this in standards. File system hierarchy dates back to 2015 in standards. And specifications bookmark that in standards. The LSB has four separate standards, core, desktop, runtime languages, and imaging. Core, desktop, runtime languages, imaging. In addition to generic requirements, there are also architecture specific requirements. There are also two areas for trial use, GTK3 and graphics. LFS attempts to conform to the architectures discussed in the previous section. Note, many people do not agree with the requirements of the LSB. LSB, Linux standard base. The main purpose of defining it is to ensure that proprietary software will be able to be installed and run properly on a compliant system. Since LFS is source-based, the user has complete control over what packages are desired and many choose not to install some packages that are specified by the LSB. 
creating a complete LFS system capable of passing the LSB certifications test is possible, but not without many additional packages that are beyond the scope of LFS. These additional packages have installation instructions in BLFS. Packages supplied by LFS need to satisfy the LSB, that's Linux standard base, requirements. LSB Core, Bash, BC, BINUTILS, CORE-UTILS, Diff Utils File, Find Utils, Gawk, GREP, GZIP, M4, MANDB, and curses, PROCPS, PSMISC, SED, Shadow, TAR, UTIL Linux, um, ZLIB, LSB Desktop, None, LSB Runtime Languages, Perl and Python, LSB Imaging, None. LSB GTK3 and LSB graphics. Trial use, none. Now, packages supplied by BLFS, that's beyond Linux from scratch, need to satisfy the Linux standard base requirements. Uh, I assume that's in addition to what's listed up here. The LSB core at batch, a part of at, CPIO, ed, VC run tab, LSB tools, NSPR, NSS, PAM, PAX, send mail or postfix or XM, time, LSB desktop, ALSA, ATK, Cairo, desktop file utils, free type, font config, GD, GDK PixBuff, GLib2, GTK plus 2, icon naming utils, libjpeg-turbo, libpng, libtiff, libxml2, mesa lib, pango, xdg utils, xorg. LSB runtime languages, libxml2, LibXSLT. I think that's LT. It could be IT. No, it's LT because you see the I here. All right, LSB imaging, cups, cups, filters, ghost script, same. LSB GTK3 and LSB graphics, trial use GTK3. Packages not supplied by LFS or BLFS needed to satisfy the LSB requirements. The uh, LSB core, the Linux standard base, core, none. The Linux standard base desktop, Qt4, but Qt5 is provided. Uh, the Linux standard base runtime languages, none. The Linux standard base imaging, none and Linux standard paste GTK3 and LSB graphics trial use none. Maybe we'll read like one more section. Rationale for packages in the book. Actually let's um, read that in another section. We'll start the next section with that. So thank you for listening.